And now to the man who will be just the fifth inaugural poet in the nation's history. Richard Blanco was, as he said, made in Cuba. He was conceived there, assembled in Spain. His mother gave birth to him there and quickly imported to the United States. He grew up in Miami. He trained and worked as a civil engineer before turning to poetry. He's published three volumes, most recently one titled Looking for the Gulf Motel. Blanco now lives in the small town of Bethel, Maine. On Monday, he will become the first Latino, the first openly gay, and the youngest poet to read his work at a presidential inauguration. Welcome to you. Thank and you, Congratulations. Jerry. Pleasure to be here. Now, let me get at some of these firsts first. This inauguration is a political event, and it's a rare meeting of, in your case, politics and poetry. What do you see yourself bringing to it? Well, I think first and foremost, hopefully a great poem. <laughs> um, uh, it's a, obviously a question that um, has been floating around in the air. Um, but um, I would think and I would hope uh, that uh, I was selected first and foremost, obviously, for respect and admiration for my work. But it is also a tremendous honor. I mean, one can't help but think of all those firsts, um, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel, I feel just in that context, it feels so much as part of the American dream, sort of a little taste of the America, so much of what the American dream is made out of, uh, to sort of, when I think about my background and um, being a little Cuban kid from Miami and all of a sudden, you know, being asked to sort of speak before the nation, for the nation, to the nation, I mean, it's just amazing and, and just besides myself. So. Well, you know, I, I read your work and it often is narrative. It tells stories about you, family history, uh, Cuban Americans. I know you can't tell us about your poem that you're going right. to give right, much right, away, right. But, but what's the narrative that you want to convey in that poem? Um, I will say, I mean, I, I will say in a word, uh, unity. Um, I think that's something that's always been on my mind um, since um, trying to fit in since I was a kid, since I was a Cuban-American kid in that sense. Trying to of, fit into what? To, to what is the American ideal or what I thought was the American ideal. I mean, I grew up between two imaginary worlds. One was the sort of 1950s of Cuba of my parents from stories and photographs and pictures and growing up in Miami in the 1970s. The other imaginary world was America, right? There was this, what I saw in the Leave it to Beaver and, and all the rest of the Brady Bunch mm -hmm. and, and living in Miami at the time in an exile community, I really thought that that kind of America really existed. So there's, my story is always about negotiation and how do, how do we fit in. Of course, that's how I started writing and that's what brought me to writing that sort of question. And as I, as I wrote more and more about it, I realized it was a universal question. How do we belong? Mm -hmm. Where do we belong? How do we belong together? What does that mean? And so that's, that's, that's kind of sort of the same, the same approach I'm taking to this poem. I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions of myself in, in the poem, even though it's in a different tone and a different voice. But it's like, what does it mean to be an American? I mean, in today's, especially in my generation, what does that mean? You know, when you mentioned coming to poetry, I was curious because you, as I said, you're trained as a civil engineer, you've worked as a civil engineer. You came to poetry, writing poetry, at least as far as I know, a little late, yes. it sounds like. <laughs> what is it that, that brought you to poetry? Well, uh, I should preface that by saying, I mean, I always had a creative bone. Mm -hmm. I was always the kind of kid that was coloring or paint by number sets or, or whatnot. And, um, but, it, Growing up in a working class family, you know, the business was survival. Like, it would be a typical sort of exile immigrant family. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted me to ensure that they wanted to ensure that I had a better life than them. So poetry yeah, wasn't one of no, the occupations no, the, in the plan. No, no. and then the, and then there was also sort of the cultural divide. So even though even though the arts were they to be discussed around the dinner table, um, it wasn't going to be frosted. Yeah. So there was also that cultural divide, and and that and so my parents sort of. Gear, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say pushed me, but they sort of encouraged me <laughs> towards these directions, mm -hmm. and I chose civil engineer because I was a whiz at math. So um, I just sort of went with that and really was outside the realm of my poss of possibility at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the reasons that, uh, that uh, I try to speak at schools as much as I can. Had I met, met a Sandra Cisneros or something when I was younger, maybe that would have been a more more of a possibility. Nevertheless, um, after I graduated from engineering, um, I started, as I say, doodling around with poetry, fooling around with poetry, then went to a creative writing course at a, at a community college, at Miami-Dade Community College, 
I, and then the one thing led to another, and as I say, the rest is history. But I was doing it for me, mm -hmm. and it was interesting because I, I think that's it was it was fun. I was doing it that degree was for me. That was just to, I, I didn't do it with any sort of end goal, and it was just well. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are indeed, in, in, a, in quite a place. Let me just ask you finally, briefly, that I gather it's family lore that your your name, Richard, you're named after another president, Richard right, Nixon. Right, right. Now here you are with President Obama. You were asked to write three poems. Somebody picks one poem, right, right. that you will read. Right. Do you know if the president himself reads the poems? I'm not certain. I mean, I get, uh, I keep on having these images of in my head about. Uh, the president sitting around the Oval Office actually reading them and checking off, but I, I'm not sure. Among think, all the things he has to Among do. all the other things. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I'm not sure exactly how the process worked, but that committee I know has worked so hard, and, and so, um, you know, we're, we just, we're just trying to sort of be as cooperative as possible and not, ask, not, not get to that level of questioning or whatnot, but um, they do, they picked one. I know, I know the White House has looked at it. I don't know exactly what that means, but... Um, yeah, they picked one, so, and overwhelmingly chose one, so. All right, we will all hear on Monday, and you and I are going to continue this talk sure. online. For now, Richard Blanco, thanks so much. Thank you. Also online, our website features extensive inauguration coverage, from a look back at presidential speeches to a rundown of the scheduled events. News Hour Politics editor Christina Bellantoni takes you on an insider's video tour of Washington, D.C., and we'll live stream the president's official swearing-in Sunday, plus all the festivities Monday. You can find our coverage on our homepage.